Hi, everybody. I'm Chuck. Uh, I am one of the co-organizers with Matt here of the Twin Cities Chaos Engineering Meetup. Uh, we meet every couple of months. Matt is going to give you a quick overview of what chaos engineering is, isn't, and maybe some jokes. If, if they land, we'll see. Um, if <laughs> they trying. don't, it's OK to boo. Uh, we do uh, encourage bravery at our meetups. We always follow it up with the fishbowl discussion. So if if anybody was to come up and sit up here, that would score you points for sure, um, <laughs> for us anyway. But I'll go ahead and let Matt take it over and, and tell you about what we do. If you do have questions, comments, um, please shout them out. Uh, we will repeat the question and try to have a little bit of a discussion about that. It's a little tough with the room way back there. But feel free to ask a question or for clarification or whatever, and we'll be sure to um, continue on that. We're not uh, we're not bashful. So let's go. Yeah. Um, so my name is Matt. I'm going to try to be, talk a little bit, but hopefully Chuck interrupts me and tells me I'm wrong. Um, sometimes you just learn things differently and speak wrong. So please interrupt me. I'm just gonna. You're wrong. I have this uh, chaos engineering book. Um, I only have one copy. I don't know how to give this away, but if anybody can tell me why. Why the heck did I uh, create my Twitter name as Shilly Vanilli? I'll give this to you <laughs> under the condition that when you bring it back to your company, hopefully you have a company with more people, you can share this book. So what I try to do where I work at Target is that I wrote my name in here, not my last name, but just my first name, and I kind of put it in an empty spot at Target North Campus, and then I was hoping it would kind of flow through the environment because I said, hey, you could learn this and pass it to another team. And I think it ended up in the garbage, but what I, if anybody wants to take this, maybe tell me why I picked Shilly Vanilli at the end. Chuck and I are going to be here at the end answering questions, networking, hoping to educate you a little bit more. So there it is. So chaos mongers unite. I don't know if everybody here wants to be a chaos monger, but Chuck and I definitely are. We want to educate you on what that means. We're kind of feeling like chaos engineering is putting the science back in computer science. Um, it's kind of a cool phrase there. Um, we're a big fan of DevOps. Um, thank you for having us here at the DevOps Meetup. We really appreciate that. And uh, we're a big fan of the third way that's kind of outlined, especially in the DevOps handbook. So that culture of continuous experimentation and learning. I don't have much of an attribute to myself or my bio for chaos engineering. It hasn't been around a long time. Um, but feelings, let's talk about feelings, OK? Chaos engineering kind of scares me. Um, it makes me happy. Sometimes it makes me sad when my systems aren't resilient to the behavior that I put into it. Um, but more or less, Chuck and I are very excited and energized. And that's kind of why we're here, to spread the word more so that you all can go back to your companies, your homes, or whatever, and kind of apply those principles of chaos engineering, too. So again, I have this book here, Chaos Engineering. But the folks at Netflix wrote the principles of chaos engineering. There's a site dedicated to this. Um, by definition, what it says is chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in a system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So does that mean purposely breaking things? Not necessarily. Sometimes you hear different definitions around town. This is kind of what I stand to. So there's a lot of testing that happens, right? So this is not another test that Chuck and I are trying to say, hey, you should do this. this. is the next coolest thing for DevOps, right? There's a lot of testing out there, stress testing, performance testing, um, unit testing, whatever kind of testing you want to do. Um, but chaos engineering, you know, it's, why it's different is like all those other testing, you're usually validating something you might know. Um, is it going to scale properly? Um, is the unit testing working? Um, so in this case, with chaos engineering, you're learning about something new. You're running a hypothesis and an experiment on your system. You're trying to educate yourself on something or you know, kind of validating what you know there. So that's kind of like the new thing. I don't know. Sometimes they say things wrong, but any. Well, I, just to elaborate a little bit, I think that the definition of chaos engineering, and there's a big argument about it, is chaos engineering, the word resiliency engineering is out there. Um, Really, for chaos engineering, it's it's about looking at the system as a whole, uh, as something you know. The word chaos um, should scare you, um, because you've created. If you've got a distributed system with hundreds of microservices, you've created a chaotic system, whether you know it or not. And something is going to happen 
Uh, there's so many things you can plan for. There's so many things you can expect. Chaos engineering is about looking at your system holistically, looking at it as an ecosystem, and formulating hypo hypothesis about how it reacts to different, uh, different inputs, different, uh, different things that can happen um, in production as if it's sort of a living thing that you don't fully understand or control. And so you have to kind of come to that, come to the realization that as smart as you think you are, uh, you do not understand your system. You do not understand what's going to happen when some system goes down, despite the fact that maybe you've run some resiliency tests in the past um, ab against those exact same uh, things, because your system has changed since yesterday, and so has the world, and so has how the users interact with it. So it's really about observing, creating hypothesis, which Matt will get into with an awesome slide later, um, and, and running tests in the, such, in the way that you would sort of almost if you're a biologist testing, um, uh, doing uh, experiments out there in the wild. Yeah, sure. So the, yeah, so the question is, you know, is this, is this Chaos Monkey? And Chaos Monkey is a tool within the chaos engineering area, the discipline, so we'll talk a little bit about that for sure. But Chaos Monkey is just a tool within. I, I can expand on that too. I think Chaos Monkey probably, sure. oh sure, I'll stand, sorry. I think Chaos Monkey, um, existed before chaos engineering as a word existed. And because um, Netflix decided that they didn't want their stuff to go down and that Amazon or AWS had inherent you know, downtime. And um, so they created Chaos Monkey in order to inject some chaos into the system. Chaos engineering was sort of the discipline that they created based on the learnings and, and, and what they did from there. And that's continued on. It's a pretty new thing. I mean, when you think of it, you know, Netflix, Netflix is the kind of pioneer in the space. Um, what it really means, I mean, we're still defining today, I think. Yeah. Um, so I'll be selling these at target.com shortly. Cards against resiliency. Um, so, like, my CEO will what if I tell her we're doing chaos engineering? Chuck? What do you, anybody? Throw out some words. What do you think? Cheer, fire you, okay, I like it. <laughs> Anything else? You know, so like, uh, I don't know if our CEO, Brian Cornell, knows we're doing chaos engineering. I hope someday he does. But uh, He does now. He does, <laughs> I guess he does now. But, but mo you know, does it, does it scare them? Are they excited? Is it, what is, what is it, right? So when you, when you go back to your companies and whatnot, like, what, what does the chaos engineering mean to you, right? So just, just to kind of clarify some things here too, like we're not experts at chaos engineering. We're still learning every day. We're trying to build a community um, that you know you can come to and learn and entertain with. Um, I also like to say that sometimes you have to hear something wrong to do it right. So I might say something wrong. Chuck may correct me. You may correct me. But if you hear it the right way, thank you. If you hear it the wrong way, I just hope you just learn. You know, like think differently about what you're currently doing. The other thing I wanted to emphasize as we kind of talk about this is start slow with chaos engineering, but don't be slow to start. Uh, the biggest thing that I've taken back at my company is like teams will be energized about it, but then they don't start. So just start doing something. Hopefully we can kind of teach you about that. And then another cool phrase um, that Casey Rosenthal and Aaron Reinhardt told me um, was collateral return on investment, collateral ROI. So as you go through these acts of chaos engineering and trying to formulate how it works at your company, there's this collateral ROI. So you're gonna learn about who you are, who your team is, how your systems respond by just trying to get through what chaos engineering is. So the gentleman in the front asked about Chaos Monkey. This is what everybody knows about Chaos Monkey. At my company, everybody's always asking about, can I have Chaos Monkey? It's cool, it's been around for like 10 or so years. Um, it'll kill your host randomly during business hours if you set it up for that so that you can respond to that host dying. But most applications are scaled appropriately to respond to your VM getting killed, right? Now, it's kind of a threat on you as a team if you know that your host is going to get killed randomly. But Chaos Monkey, again, it was cool, but it's the Chaos Engineering has developed so much more than what Chaos, Engineer, what Chaos Monkey is. So with Netflix, and I, I hope people are noticing I'm using the first Netflix logo. It's my favorite. I don't know. Um, so this is Visceral. So Netflix has this open source tool. Um, it's kind of to show the complexity of your traffic and data management here. Um, but Chaos Monkey worked for Netflix, but they needed something more, right? So 
think of all these as microservices and like dependencies and interactions. It's great. It's a crazy world out there. So they develop Chat, the chaos automation platform, right? It's today maybe the most sophisticated chaos engineering tool. So just to talk about that simply, what they did is as you deploy into production, it takes chat takes a certain percentage of your traffic. So just say five percent of production traffic, and two and a half percent of that goes through a control, and two and a half percent goes through an experiment. And there's key performance indicators, KPIs, that are set. So as your experiment, your chaos engineer experiment is running, if those KPIs deviate to what you as the product owner engineering team set up, it'll flag and notify the product owner so that they could potentially roll back the system. So it's automated in. chaos. I'm going to jump in and add yeah. a little context. Come on in. This is kind of an important thing about chaos engineering and when you're wondering to yourself why you're not doing chaos engineering or if you think you are doing chaos engineering, um, they've created this system so that as they deploy new services or new code into production, they can take a small fraction of their actual um, their actual uh, traffic and do a control test versus a versus a test with the new code. And in order to be able to do that, first thing you have to do is be able to measure customer value, and they measure it based on streaming starts per second. minute. Stream, streaming starts per second. Yes. So streaming starts per second, yes. ironic, or not ironically, coincidentally. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so they're able to say, if you're outside of a boundary of, say, 5 or 10% of what that should be, then it'll automatically roll back the services, cancel the experiment. If it's doing better, it'll continue the experiment and eventually code will roll out. So this is really tightly integrated with their deployment system and all of their services. I think that Nora Jones was saying that this is now mandatory for all of their services like eventually to, to mature into that. So um, that's the kind of stuff you have to be able to do to do chaos engineering. It's not like, hey, you can just start this tomorrow. Um, you have to be able to measure. You have to understand what customer impact is. You have to know when your customers are impacted by looking on a screen or being able to do some, some equations, which is not easy to do. I mean, it's, we can measure CPU and memory and all that stuff pretty easily. Everybody can do that. But really understanding when your customers are impacted and when the value proposition of your organization is being impacted, and that's part of what they do. And so this is tightly integrated into that system. You can't just download this and suddenly start using it at work. Um, you know, yeah, Chap is not open source. Um, they don't have any plans of making that open source. Um, this kind of leads into a guy that I know, Chuck. Um, he's on Twitter student of agile he kind of summed it up so like we just talked about netflix right so like we're discovering that other than some very large and forward-thinking organizations some and some very small shops that don't have like this legacy pack deck thing mainframe right um it's not a priority so like everybody here if you're not i don't need to raise hands here but if you're not doing chaos engineering you know that that's okay that's kind of the norm that we're seeing right um there's also this guy named matt he likes cats so like he tweets a lot about cat videos and stuff, but uh, you'll also notice a hundred times more people care about cat videos than chaos engineering. <laughs> I maybe, I maybe changed that, so I don't know for that. So I run chaos engineering experiments in production. Yay! Is anybody actually doing chaos engineering? Well, even not in production. Usually, people don't start in production. You got to kind of work your way up. Like it, it's kind of hard. Any, to do. Is anybody running chaos engineering experience in their dreams? In there. Okay. In their imagination. Good. For me, my my response was imagination. You know, I'm at Code Forty Two. We are not doing chaos engineering. We've done, um, we've done a little bit uh, of this type of experimentation on some of our uh, internal systems, like Jenkins. Does somebody have something to say back there? Um, the the. Feel free to speak up, by the way, if you've got if you've got input. Um, you know, we took down a, a, a one of our domain servers, for example, and Jenkins freaked out, and we couldn't figure out why. And so we had the hypothesis that that was a total coincidence, and so we did it again, and things went totally crazy. And so that actually led to a lot of learning, and we're now at the point where we can take that server down without any um, without any problems. So that's that's kind of the best that we do. It's nothing automated. It's not fully there. It's kind of insulated from our customers at this point, but. It's that kind of culture of experimentation. So yeah. that's why my <laughs> mine was in my imagination. Yeah. Um, so my favorite tool to read Havoc is Comcast. Comcast. All right. There we go. Anybody else? Mother-in-law, father, -in -law, father -in -law, <laughs> kids, whatever. Yeah, so this kind of leads into tools. Um, so there's a lot of 
open source tools for chaos engineering. There's also a paid service called Gremlin. Um, target where I work, we utilize Gremlin as well as we're experimenting with some open source tools. Uh, these are just pictures. I'm going to have links and educational information that I can attach to the slide when we upload to the meetup for anybody that wants to see this information in real or share it with your friends. Uh, but there's a lot of open source tools to inject latency, kill VMs, like I said, um, just do all these experiments. Um, the cool thing, so like, for example, if you're running Kubernetes and you want to purposely kill your pods um, and test that they're gonna, your workers are going to come back up, you can have Pod Reaper, which is written by a friend of mine, Purple, at Target. Um, so there's all these cool tools that kind of you can use for chaos experiments, right? Uh, but the thing is, um, as Casey Rosenthal, who's one of the founders of Chaos Engineering, says, tools don't necessarily create the resilience human do, humans do, but um, tools can help, right? So that's kind of what we're shaping out at Target and other places. What tools do you need to catalyst your systems, to catalyst your humans and the teams to like drive the chaos engineering and resiliency? Um, so like here's another play. So like blank engineering. Is it chaos engineering? Is it resilience engineering? Is it resiliency engineering? Is it resil ain't engineering? I don't know. What like what do you call it at Code 42? We don't call it anything at Code 42. Yeah, so we call it that crazy thing that Chuck's talking about. <laughs> that crazy thing. Yeah, so I mean it kind of depends like where you're at, what you want to call, right? In true nature, it's chaos engineering. But like for example, at Target. We called it resiliency engineering because we're trying to, besides the chaos experience, we're trying to shape the behavior of our development teams. Um, so it's more of like resilience and how we respond. But it works for us. It works for our leadership. It works for our teams. But it's definitely, like, if you want to use chaos engineering, that's cool. So that's kind of where it's at. Um, the other thing we were going to kind of talk about, all these chaos engineering tools and experiments lead into game days. So again, what chaos engineering is, what Chuck said at the beginning, you know, it's that scientific Typic method, creating that hypothesis and running that science, um, doing the attacks, shaping the behavior, and then closing in on the gaps. One thing that my first grader, Viola, taught me um, with the scientific method is that you can start out here, right? So if you don't have a template to use for chaos engineering at your company, take, take advice from my first grader here. So, you know, ask a question, make a hypothesis, test that hypothesis. You know, record the results, draw a conclusion. Things that are missing from here are like the steady state. Like, what does my environment look like? So when I inject some failure, like, and it deviates, like, what does that steady state look like? But for the most part, the thing is that I've experienced, experience is teams are kind of scared to start. But again, if, if you can take a first grader's method on the scientific method, I mean, you or your company could just start this. Even if you aren't breaking things in production, you can just start at a table around lunch to talk about these ideas. This is what Chuck and I are trying to energize the community around, just because we're not seeing companies. We didn't see too many hands in the audience raised when they were talking about chaos engineering. They're not doing it yet. And that's OK. It's not for everybody. But we would like it to be in some fashion. So yeah. So like one example, just real quick, too. Um, so this is, think of it like as an enterprise API, OK? So we ran a game day where we injected latency using Gremlin around all of our Redis servers. This app is split amongst two data centers, right? So by definition, you don't necessarily want to run chaos experiments on a single point of failure, because you are, already know it might break. Um, but in this case, you know, like we're building these complex systems, right? Like we're using new technology, we're doing cool new things, there's a lot of development teams, there's new people, experienced people. So like what we use this <coughs> platform for was injecting latency from the API with all the Redis servers just to see how it failed over, how it tested all of our circuit breakers in between. And uh, a lot of things we learned was just we didn't have the metrics in place, the alerts in place, the dashboards in place, just all that around and everything. Um, so like my favorite thing to do during a game day of that is what? Break things, eat popcorn, cookies. What do you think? <laughs> Anybody? Break stuff. Break stuff. Learn. I think learn is kind of the biggest thing, right? So you're an actual, like, when you're responding to an incident, right, you're getting called at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, you're trying to recover as quickly as possible. You're not necessarily trying to learn and share that knowledge, right? So during an actual game day, that's when you actually can, like, pause and learn, slow down, take, take that away. You don't have to recover as quickly as possible. Um, the thing that I mentioned, too, so you used to call me on my cell phone. One misnomer of chaos engineering, some people say that 
it'll prevent that 3 a.m. phone call. You own your system 24-7, you're still going to get called in the middle of the night. It's just when you get that call, hopefully you can respond quicker because the game days allowed you to evolve your playbooks, your runbooks to recover quicker and everything. As we go into this, so I hope I offend people with this. I don't know, I kind of want to get some energy going, but you can only call yourself a DevOps engineer if you're doing chaos engineering. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I mean, there's so many things to be DevOps and everything. So like, what works for you and your company? So like, does chaos engineering fit into where you're at right now? Or are there other priorities and everything that you need to propose for your company? I don't know. This is kind of just something to think about. The other thing I wanted to say, I know like Chuck elaborated on, there's so many prereqs to chaos engineering. But the thing that I've learned is even if you're not ready for chaos engineering and you like do a, try to do a game day, but maybe it's like a non-technical game day where you're sitting at the table just to kind of run through like a tabletop, um, it helps kind of like celebrate the diversity at the table. So you have new, new employees, interns, um, experienced employees at the table, you have backgrounds of all sorts. At, during a game day, during chaos engineering, you're sitting around the table, everybody's equal. Everybody, you know, you have this experienced person that can fix it, but you tell them just to be quiet. Let everybody else learn. You know, I, let everybody respond. You know, the alerts maybe aren't going off, but that experienced engineer can see it. Just kind of hold back. You know, let the new people kind of resolve and kind of understand um, kind of what's going on. Kind of what it leads into is like, I have confidence. So if you're a fan of the sound of music, um, here it is. But game days and chaos engineering kind of build that confidence of everything. Um, so three things that you can do um, if you, at your company. So if you set up reoccurring chaos, um, meaning like once a week, every other week, set up something to talk about it, whether that's a discussion, learning, bringing a team together, um, or if you actually are prepared to run chaos experiments, just set up that reoccurring just to keep talking through it. Review alerts, dashboards, page outs. Um, so prior incidents that you've experienced, run that through, like how could chaos engineering have caught this, prevented this, or how could have game day done that? It's easy to do, and then just to find champions. Find the people in your organization that are excited about this and latch on to them, lean on them, and kind of drive through. So those are kind of the three takeaways. Um, we we're gonna invite you to our meetup. We kind of have this chaos fight club. Um, so we have some simple rules, which sums up to learn. Um, this is kind of our, our environment where it's just open. So if you are intimidated by chaos engineering, come to our meetup. And uh, is Andy in there? Andy's in there. Even Andy comes to our meetups, right? But it's just very open for you to learn about chaos engineering and everything. Um, there's a bunch of books that we've learned and read through to teach about chaos engineering that are up there. Um, there's some links. Again, we're going to publish this to the meetup group so you guys can have it. And uh, yeah. We talked a lot longer than we thought, but it was kind of fun having some dialogue and some questions in the audience and everything. But I'm really excited for James to come up here. I don't know about you, so I definitely don't mind stopping. <laughs> but yeah, Any, anything special? Go ahead. Question into a mic. Yeah. Oh, oh, Sorry. Sure. I guess when I think of chaos engineering, I, I've always kind of thought that my organization, my application, what, whatever I was testing, really needed to be at a certain maturity level <laughs> before I did chaos testing because, yeah, I've got that single point of failure. If I take it down, I know I'm gonna have trouble. I don't, I don't really need to test that. Um, so, I, 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 but I hear you suggesting that we should be thinking about that anyway with tabletop exercises and at least get those things on the board so it becomes priorities. Is that, that really kind of what yeah. you're suggesting? I'll, I'll chime in quick and then Chuck will probably say. So like, I have a pretty good disaster recovery business continuity background where we always run tabletops, but culturally it's very challenging to shape your organization for chaos engineering. So what I found is if you start talking to talk, walking the walk there, um, it'll get you ready for when your application is ready to test. So, because um, if, you, if you wait until your application is ready, Culturally, your team's like, it's gonna just take on exponential time to get there, usually, depending on how big your organization is. But. So my addition to that would be, if your stuff is not ready to test, uh, it do chaos engineering, you're right, you shouldn't start, there's no reason to do it if you know it's gonna fail if this particular thing goes on. Your competitors, though, are. And it's important to understand that wherever you are in your life cycle of your organization, if you're not trying to get better, 
your competitors are going to pass you by. And so chaos engineering is sort of something to look forward to. And if you think about all the things that you have to do to be able to do chaos engineering, how much you'd have to lift your organization to get there, that's kind of the point. Um, because what you're doing is you're moving yourself forward. And if you're not going to do it and your competitors are doing it, you're, you're going to lose. Yeah, good question, though. What's the difference between chaos engineering and resiliency engineering? This is a great topic. Chaos engineering is better. Um, <laughs> it is better. Don't listen to the booze. Um, the, um, depending on, there, there's, a, there's a big debate about this, and you should add your voice to, to the conversation. Um, I'll give you my unbiased opinion, uh, which is chaos engineering is really about understanding your ecosystem and how it's evolving and how it's moving and what it's turning into and w what sort of stimulus um, can change the behavior of your system. Resiliency engineering is about inserting failure between a couple of different services and finding out for sure and building confidence in that your systems <laughs> react the way that they were supposed to react. And so there's a ton of overlap there. Some people would say that resiliency engineering is a superset of chaos engineering. I would argue that it's the other way around, that chaos engineering is more of a science and a discipline, or resiliency engineering is one of the tools that you use to get there. However, if you stop at resiliency engineering, you're basically expecting that you've got a steady state and that you're testing against the steady state, where chaos engineering is more about understanding the broader picture. Look up John Alls. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so if you want to understand what resiliency engineering is, Eric Hollenagel uh, is, the, is the person that you should look up because he defined what it is. Um, there's a bunch of people in the safety community that are all about the resiliency engineering. Uh, I happen to like it. Um, if, you want to, if you want to have a conversation about it, come talk to me. There, there is a, there's a dev jam coming up on March 20th where I think we'll talk about this more. So between a re resiliency engineering and chaos engineering, I mean, is there a mapping of these applications and what their critical KPIs are? Because if you're going to introduce chaos into these systems, you need to have a baseline of understanding of what you're trying to target. I think one of the prerequisites is for you to figure that out for yourself. Yeah. Steady state. you got to figure out what your KPIs are. And it's more than just, it's really about understanding what your customer value is. All right, I think that we're, we're done with Q&A for the moment, so if you can please give it up for Matt and Chalk. Thank you.